Well, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. So my question is, how do you see yourself? How do you see yourself? And actually, most of you, I think, these days from the selfie generation, see yourselves like that uh, in your own uh, image, in your own device. But as a neuroscientist, the way we see the world is driven by a lot of things of which you're not aware. When I was sitting up there earlier with Stefan and we were looking down at the red spot on the stage, on his camera, it looked yellow, which is kind of weird. And in fact, even color is a construction. It's something that you make up in your own mind. So I'm going to tell you a card trick now that you can do on yourself. And you probably shouldn't do it here because it would sort of spoil the flow of my talk. But take this away from here, back home. So there's a card trick you can do on yourself. You pick a card, any card, but you don't show it to yourself. And then you hold it out to the side of you like this, and you keep your eyes front. And what you do is you gradually wiggle the card and bring it towards the front of you, towards the front of you, and towards the front of you. And the question is, when do you see whether it's a red card or a black card? Okay? And the answer is, if you try this at home, you'll find that even though you can see something wiggling, even when it's here, when it's here, when it's here, you don't see if it's a red or a black card until it's about there, and you don't see what number it is until it's about here. And that's because your vision in the periphery, around the edge of your eye, is black and white, not color. But when you look around this room, you see color everywhere. Okay? And the question is, how do you do that? And the answer is you project. You invent the colors that you see from inside your own head and you project them out into the world. So the prejudices and the expectations that you bring to the world make your reality. And that's not just a political statement, although it is also a political statement. That's a statement about how the visual system works. That is how your brain constructs things. Everything we see is a story that we're telling ourselves. And there are three tiny vignettes I want to give you today about seeing. And the first one is about a woman from Birmingham, in fact. Some of you might know this woman. Her name is Janika Lea. And she is uh, uh, a woman who has sickle cell disease. Uh, she's also a performer and a writer from Birmingham. And sickle cell disease is an inherited condition that particularly affects people from uh, Africa, African origin. And the reason why it probably hasn't been selected out is because it gives you some kind of immunity against malaria which, as you know, is an incredibly serious disease that you can catch from mosquitoes. But also, because your blood cells in this condition are sickle-shaped, shaped like a sickle, not round, they get stuck all over your body. And they produce these things called crises. And the crisis has been described to me by people with sickle cell as the worst pain you can ever imagine, but from the inside of your body and all over. It can start in the arm and it can spread round. And these people get record-breaking doses of morphine because the pain is so severe. And the question I want to ask you is, what does the reality of that condition look like to Janika Lea? And I'll tell you the answer. And this experience happened to me last week only, when at Science Gallery London we commissioned Tough Blood, and you can see Stephen Rutter at the back there, to make a dance performance about sickle cell, which Janika introduced. Now, there's been some interesting research on this, and the question is, uh, what do you call yourself if you've got a condition? So some people would say, I'm a patient, I'm a sufferer, or I'm a victim, or I'm a survivor. And what I've told you as a neuroscientist in the last couple of minutes, and what you've heard all afternoon, you already know this all day, what you call yourself changes how you see yourself, and how you see yourself changes how other people see you. So the term you use changes who you are. And again, that's a biological fact, not of just a political statement. And Janika Lea introduces herself not as a sickle cell survivor, but as a sickle cell warrior. Okay? She's a sickle cell warrior. She is fighting for the disease, and she's fighting for the people with the disease from the black population who are suffering with it, but who are turning their own lives around. And she's generating information and sharing content. Now, what were we doing with her in Peckham, in South London, the Science Gallery last week? The answer is we were generating collisions between science and art. And we were doing that because we believe it's important for the future of the planet, and we were doing it with the help of young people and performers who were making the work for us. So this is the performance that she had just introduced. Stephen Rudder produced it. He shot documentary video, as you can see on the left of the screen, of people from the Peckham area who disproportionately have the disease and other people in the UK, and had choreographed a dance performance which showed the body of a black man acting out the suffering, the physical suffering that he was feeling, and also asking, is this a racist disease? Is this a disease of race? And the answer is, genetically, it's correlated with the color of your skin. But the way the disease is identified, it was the first genetically identified disease ever discovered in history. But it was seen as disease of black, black people. And so arguably, the treatment of it, uh, the way that people who have it, the warriors, are treated, is dependent on how they look as well.
Now, this event took place in Peckham because our gallery in London Bridge hasn't yet opened. And the people who came to it, a lot of them from the Sickle Cell Society, were not people who would necessarily... Now, I've already seen from a previous speaker, I'm not going to do a show of hands because it's probably not going to go the way I'm expecting. But the way a lot of these people had not seen a video arts dance performance before. And after that, they had a talk about the genetics of sickle cell. And there was a conjunction, a bringing together of those two things of science and art, which allowed this particular population to see themselves differently, to get the facts in a different way, and to see themselves as political beings and as warriors as well. Now, if we're talking about courage, I want to make a plea from the science side for a particular kind of courage. If you ask, how do you see yourself? I'm going to give you an answer from a picture that was taken about a month ago. And you know the you are here arrow uh, that you often get in pictures, which would right now be pointing at the Hippodrome in Birmingham. The little arrow in the bottom right of that picture is us. That's a picture taken by Cassini Huygens, which is a spacecraft that heroically crashed itself into the surface of Saturn last week, ending a 20-year voyage uh, in which it discovered the first liquid wa water off the Earth's surface anywhere in the solar system. And it travelled over a billion miles to rendezvous with Saturn, fly through the rings and orbit the moons. Cassini Huygens is an act of courage by the scientists who designed it, and it was launched just over 20 years ago, before many of you were born. Now, some of you will have seen the film Hidden Figures that was about the calculators that launched the space program in the US. Now, a calculator, by the way, in those days was a human, not a computer. And a lot of the calculators that were doing the moonshot trajectories were black women from southern states in the US who couldn't even use the same toilets as the white flight engineers in the NASA laboratories. But they were the ones who were calculating the trajectories. And in fact, there were a lot of women behind the Cassini probe who had sort of gestated, had given birth, as it were, to this spacecraft and then watched it fly to Saturn. And from a scientific perspective, it seems to me that if you can dream enough to take tiny, tiny steps, the infinitesimally small calculations that allow you to predict what this spacecraft was going to do 20 years later as it crashed in flames into the surface of Saturn. That's a projection. That's how you can see yourself. If you can imagine yourself as the person who designed a small part of that spa spacecraft or the communications equipment, that is sending signals back to an Earth which it couldn't have dreamed of when it was launched, that's the kind of courage that we're interested in. Now, at Science Gallery, the big risk that we're taking, and that's why we're here today, is to allow young people to shape the program that we build. We do seasons of activity, and the one that we did last before the current one was called Mouthy. And I will tell you about a proposal that we got from a young artist called Inez Camera Lorette. And she wrote to us through our open call, and you can see online if you search for Science Gallery, about a particular thing that she'd been doing in the comfort of her own home in the run-up to this. To the right of the picture, you can see an image of a month's worth of Inez's saliva. Inez had been spitting into a bucket uh, for a month and collecting her own saliva. And in the way that artists do, and that's the reason why I enjoy working with artists, she had become obsessed with a single thing. And any of you who are artists or who know artists will understand what this is like. It didn't matter where she was or what she was doing. She was obsessed with the idea of crystallizing saliva. And she found a process by which she was able to make what she called a spit crystal. And this is the crystal which she constructed from a month's worth of her own saliva. Uh, and when we heard about this, we thought that this would be a good uh, symbolic opening for the gallery. Now, I don't know how many of you have done any kind of performance in continental Europe, but downstairs, I have to say, it's a really weird situation going on in the dressing rooms down there, just for those of you that haven't been backstage. But there's a performance of hairspray going on in the Hippodrome. And so we keep bumping into people in tights, walking up and down and hearing their two-minute call. But um, uh, uh, in the UK, before you go on stage, you say, break a leg. In Europe, what you say is toy, toy, toy. It's a phrase that they use in Europe. Toy, 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 again, from a different religious tradition you might have heard of this, is a spitting sound to ward off the evil eye. Okay? So it's for luck. You say toy, 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 to wish for luck. So when we built the Science Gallery proposal, we decided to have a launch party, and we got everybody who came to the party to spit in a bucket collectively. So we had a bucket of spit from everybody who'd attend attended the launch party. And then we got Inez to build us a crystal out of all of the spit. Now, this isn't being recorded, is it? But I mean, we don't actually have ethics for this. But as a matter of fact, we've got the DNA of everybody who came to the launch party uh, in crystalline form. And in a sense, that was a way of symbolizing people's participation in this youth-led program. And here's the interesting thing. Inez is a young artist from Spain working in London 
while these things are still possible. And through the program, she met a professor called Brian Sutton. Now, some of you will have heard of a woman called Rosalind Franklin, who helped to discover DNA, and she worked at King's. Brian had worked under her professor as well. And he's an expert in X-ray crystallography. When he heard about Inez's project, he said, no, what she's doing isn't a spit crystal, it's a crystal with spit in it. Uh, because he looked at the reaction that she'd done, and he put her spit crystal into an electron microscope and looked at the structures of it. And he then worked with her for six months to make a crystal that was genuinely made out of spit. And what you can see here at the opening of Mouthy is a visualization of a crystal where if everybody in the world were to spit once into a massive bucket, and then Inez were to run the process, that would be a piece of spit that would contain the DNA of everyone on the planet. That's how small the DNA is that makes us all human, that unites us and divides us. Now, it turns out that Brian, who's a world expert in X-ray crystallography, could not have come up with the idea of crystallizing out spit as a protein were it not for Inez. So although you might think that art is there to beautify science, that it's there in the service of science, that the hard stuff is done by scientists, and the artists just make it comprehensible. What we believe at Science Gallery is that the progress that we need to make to make the world what it needs to be is about the conjunctions between people from different places who can interact on their own terms and not just find new knowledge, but share ignorance. Because in the end, if you're going to work with people who aren't like you, and there I'm talking about culture, about race, about art, about science, you've got to be prepared to tolerate people who talk a language you don't understand. And if you're prepared to make spaces where ignorance is allowed, where people can communicate what they're doing uh, without fear of being misunderstood, where it's being shared, then you can build great structures. Now, our current show, and I was going to do material on this, is called Blood. And in it, we have a lot of menstruation. And it's so rare. Who could have thought, except at TEDx Youth Brum, that I would have had my menstrual blood gags taken by a previous speaker? But so it is. <laughs> but if you find yourself in South London uh, or online, look up the Blood Life Uncut series, where we've got lots of incredible material about gay blood. So still, if you're, an heteros if you're a homosexual man who's sexually active, you're not allowed to donate blood in this country. So we've got a project about blood equality. I've got some very interesting projects about menstruation, which I can't tell you about, and some interesting things about white blood cells. But the final point I want to make, how you see yourself is driven by the language that you use, the people you associate, and the places that you find yourselves. TEDx Youth Brum is a good starting point, but I encourage you to build your structures and to engage with people not like you. And if you use that diversity, there's no telling what you can achieve. Thank you very much. <laughs>